Hi, Dean. Mics. There we go. Can you hear me now? I can. I've got you on mute. Thanks for for navigating through the um, uh, the 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 online navigation of uh, of Remo. So, um, I'm expecting one other person to jump into our presenter's view of this, um, and I will wait to for them to join. Um, but just to kick things off, so as um, well everyone to our uh, BitterX Remo monthly uh, monthly event. So thank you for everyone for taking a bit of time to first of all navigate through our uh, digital networking experience that we've got uh, on the Remo platform. Um, appreciate we only gave a, a probably a small amount of time um, but we wanted to um, get our sort of presentation part done and what we'll do is we'll leave the event open uh, after after the speaking's done um, so that people can continue to um, try and make the best of our digital networking solution that we're using uh, jumping from table to table um, after we've uh, got the main 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 part out of the way um, so before we kick things off what, what I what I wanted to cover today was um, I'll just briefly touch on a, a bit of background on on bitter and bitter X for those that are sort of joining us on an online event for um, for the first time and um, Dean we're very happy to welcome you and um, I'm looking forward to the conversation we'll, we'll be having um, from a participant point of view and and everyone that's uh, online, um, please do uh, feel free to field your questions uh, in the chat function, and uh, it's an opportunity to have your questions answered by Dean. Um, and then I will have, um, and then to close things off, um, my fellow sort of Bitter X board may, uh, member, uh, Tin and Dixon, will be closing off uh, the event um, once I'm confident that he has navigated onto the section that he needs to be on. So in and if you're listening um to reach out to laura and work out how to uh, to get on this uh, this this section um but so just for a bit brief bit of background for those that this is their first uh, bitter event or, or bitter x event is the first one we've done uh in an evening in this format um bitter was formed in 2012 um and it was really created by a uh, community of passionate individuals and business owners uh, you know with a view of sharing knowledge and, and making connections and it, and it lives by uh, people who know people who help people all my interactions with the organization over the number of previous years uh, you know very much demonstrated that um, there's some great initiatives that bitter have their um, chapters up and down the country um, and the um, team um, that we uh, this represents is bitter x which is our specifically the chapter uh, geared around uh, young professionals and um, what it is we do is we provide education expertise and uh, you know quality events and access to mentoring for the young professionals uh, in our network we've developed our own board of young passionate uh, individuals who uh, volunteer their time like myself um, to helping us get to this mission um, and I think you know putting on events like this to our network to our community um, allow people to um, uh, you know, for us to to sort of live by that mission a little bit. And I think now more than ever, um, you know, if anyone saw the news yesterday around uh, the UK unemployment numbers, um, two thirds of those people were young individuals under the age of 25. Um, so we've really got a good opportunity to sort of club together with our resources, with issues that are expecting um, relevant uh, to the young professionals in our network. Um, but without further ado, um, I said we, we've, we've managed to arrange some time today to speak to Dean Kelly. Um, Dean is a, an entrepreneur. He's, he's a business a business owner running several businesses. Um, but, you know, specifically, um, you know, when we spoke ahead of this conversation, Dean, um, you know, it stood to me that, you know, you were in quite high positions of responsibility quite earlier in your career mm. as a professional. Uh, and I think you were billed as the, well, you were billed as the, at one point, you were the youngest CEO of a publicly listed company um, at the age of 30. Did I get that right? Yeah, apparently, apparently so. Well, I, I didn't go and check, but it was on Motley Fool and, and someone who was working with me pulled it in and said, have you seen this? And uh, so it, it was fun for a few minutes and it kind of stuck and it's nice to put on the on the resume, but I didn't actually go and check. But I think 30 was was quite young, really, to be running a listed business. 
Yeah, well, the, the youngest, according to our, our Motley Fool's uh, t- t- database. Um, so, I, I mean, Dean, it'd be really interesting, I suppose, uh, you know, to, to hear a bit about your journey that brought you into those, uh, you know, positions of uh, re- responsibility as a young, you know, as a, uh, you know, a, as a young professional yourself when you were, we were in them. Um, be interesting to hear about, a bit about your, your early career and, um, and what you got you to that position. Yeah, um, I, d- I don't. I don't think initially I set out. I've never set out to run a PLC. It was um, something that happened, and I'll, I'll probably get into that a bit later. But my my background's recruitment. I got into recruitment in 1998, and I struggled at first for the first six months. I I really struggled. It was, a, it was such a vibrant, outward salesy environment. I'd never been in anything like that before, but I desperately wanted to be good at it. And I was quickly noted for being the hardest worker in the room. I was in the earliest. I stayed the latest. Actually, my boss from right back then is my business partner in one of my businesses, my networks at the, at the moment. So after about six months, the penny dropped. I started doing well. And I started to bill as you do in recruitment. And the following year, I became one of the biggest billers in the industry. And just, you know, just through hard work. I don't think I had necessarily had skills or anything else that others didn't have. And just by chance, I was interviewed by the Evening Standard back when the pink pages meant something and people used to read it. And it was, is the internet too too hot to handle? And uh, I I forget roughly what I was saying, but they they produced this story of, uh, Dean Kelly says it's too hot to handle. They're paying people too much money. They're not, and obviously, you know, it did crash. Um, And I I, did I have any foresight on that? Absolutely none. (laughs) <laughs> but what it did do and actually it wasn't very good because I was running an e-commerce desk at the time as well which was which was awful um the the the, the, the paper and, and and the kind of incestualness of recruitment I then got headhunted by some chaps who'd set up a recruitment company it'd been going I don't know two or three months had about four people there and you know I'd been in recruitment three and a half years I was still a baby really but they'd seen this article they knew someone who knew me and knew about my billings and what I was doing and what I was achieving. And so, you know, they, they spent another month and a half, two months head on me and they, they got me in, they hooked me in with the, we'll give you equity and equity is worth this, you know, just because you're earning these big bucks, that won't last forever. You, you know, you don't want to be a phone monkey for someone else forever. And, and I got that and I hadn't lived that life for 10 years. I was making more money in, in net in a month than most of my friends were making in a year. But I didn't live that lifestyle, you know, I, I didn't subscribe to going out and, and spending it on stupid things. And so I thought, right, you know, another, this, this career path's already jumping up. I'll do this. And um, they never really did any DD on me. They never they, they asked my billings, but they never looked at how long I'd been doing this job or the size of the teams that I'd run, which had been two people before then. And uh, I took on these, these these four consultants they had. Every single one of them had more experience than me. All of them were older than me, which were, which, you know, in itself can be quite difficult. And it's like, who's this whippersnapper who doesn't have to bill, who's going to be a manager and a director? And just to cut that long story short, I mean, I grew that to 42 people in 13 months. And the only reason, um, you know, looking back that I, I kind of went off and started my own business is because like many, many businesses, you're set an equity target. And if you hit that, you're going to get that percentage. If you hit that, you'll get a bit more if you smash it out of the park, you'll do this. And, and we got into a bit of a, a back and forth about, well, you know, we, did, we didn't expect it. And at that moment in time, I thought, I'm not gonna argue over this because the fact that we're having that conversation means this is the wrong place for me. Um, I've done what I said I would do. I've turned you a profit. I've grown, I started an education division for them because it was IT recruitment I set up. So I, I went off and did it myself. So I think, I was quite lucky in business when I look back and you do analyze at the time, you just think you're a hero. Um, but you look back and you say to yourself, right, okay, what was, what was the precursor to that success? I got to do it with somebody else's money for a, over a year. Um, and they kind of left me to get on with it. And I think you do, tr- you, you know, you fail fast, you learn quicker. And, and I was just all the time I was doing this iterative process of trying new things, being contrarian to, what others were doing in the marketplace and it started to pay off for me so that was my early career just before i went in and you know four years in i started my own business okay interesting did, did you feel that um 
you know, in the early stage, picking up the skills, knowledge and, you know, what you needed to give you the tools to, to start to, you know, move into, you know, leading a business. Mm. Is that something that came quite naturally to you? Or is it something you really had to really had to, to, to work on to it doesn't sound like you had a huge amount of time to embed those skills. No, you didn't. Um, I'm, you probably can tell by this chair. I'm not a big bloke. I'm five eight. Um, you know, I'm, I've always kept trim. I used to box, and so I'm not. I'm not someone who walks in a room and you say that's the boss. You know, I used to walk in with people who worked for me. It was six footers, and and people thinking, well, they they must be the boss. Um, but when 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 you've got that, you know, I'd, I'd competed at good levels in sport. I always had that I suppose leadership qualities not not in a in a, in a very you know aggressive way or, or anything of that kind if you know back, back when I was a child and, and when I was a teenager and when I was in my early 20s if there was a problem my friends came to me I was the solution provider I could work things out and it and it kind of magnetizes you so I always had that about me and um, the one thing I, I, I do a bit of mentoring now and, and helping businesses I talk about purpose passion vision and belief and back then I had passion, vision, and belief. And, and that passion was, I felt I could do things that others thought I couldn't do. The vision, you know, I had this big end game of where I was gonna to get to, and I had ultimate belief in myself. So I, I think you learn a lot there. When, when you're older, you kind of, you've seen too many no's, you've seen too many situations, and you're more likely to talk yourself out of something. Mm. And, and I know that because I'm older now. We go, well, I've seen that before. And that, that's, but that naivety, that, that, that energy of just being able to go, right, do you know what, I'm going to go, and if I go down, I'm going to go again. Um, and I suppose to, just to, just to finalise that question, I got asked the other week, you in your late 20s versus you now in your 40s, who wins starting a business and whatever? And I was like, okay, I know all this stuff now. I've, I've built and sold businesses and whatever else. I still put my money on me in my 20s because I just had so much go, so much energy. And I think that actually, that magnetizes people, but attitudes are contagious. People want to be around that. They feel it's success. So I don't think you need to read a leadership book to get there, but you just always need to be learning. Everything you, everything you do every day should be a learning process. You should always be better than you were yesterday. And I live my life by that as well. Yeah, you know, great, 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 great to, um, to, to get that insight. I mean, did you feel under a lot more I don't know pressure or scrutiny you know being a little bit less experienced in terms of years and being being younger yeah there, there, it's, it's kind of horses for courses so I, I moved into working in education um, obviously you deal with public sector bodies um, and there's a lot of unconscious bias there so I would go to meetings turn up and I would have a steering committee that I was going to, and they're, and they're looking around for me, you know, where, where's your boss, you know, type scenario. Whereas the business we did in the private sector was very different. Um, it was, it was extremely different. I mean, it, actually the, the, the my, my first business I sold for a strong eight figure sum in under three years. And why did it grow so fast? Well, one of, one of the catalysts is catalyst for that, that, that kind of exponential growth was in my first couple of weeks of running that business or starting that business, I was pitching to, to schools and I, and I read about this uh, set of schools in Dubai called Gems. If you've ever been to Dubai and you drive down the, the Arrow Shakes, I hear road, you'll see all these gem schools. And a chap called Sonny Varkey. And I read, read about this thing in The Economist and uh, I was used to read everything just for leads. Looking around, got hold of the numbers, phoned around, phoned around, got to Dubai, got back, got his mobile number after three hours of networking people. I got 45 seconds to pitch to him on the phone because he said, you've got 45 seconds. I asked, this is a little little hack for anybody. If you ever get a, a, a billionaire or a multi multi millionaire says you've got 45 seconds, ask them about themselves. They've all got a backstory and they all love to tell it. And we were on the phone 45 minutes. I had breakfast with him the next morning. He met me. You know, I do. I look young for my age. I looked worse back then. I look very young for my age. And I was sat there at this table in the Dorchester with a proposal from Serco and a proposal from Capita, two listed businesses in front of me. I was two weeks old. But I thought to myself, as long as I give a good show of myself, I'll be quite happy with that. I've met this person who's, you know, a, a billionaire and I'm in the Dorchester and he's massive three suites that he keeps and I'm having breakfast with him. You know, that's not a, that's not a bad result for, for someone just starting a business. But he flew me out to Dubai two weeks later. Long story short, I got all of his business. Um, 
yeah, I, I, you know, I no doubt he looked younger than anybody else that he'd seen. Uh, I was up against listed businesses who had very good proposals. He never did DD on me or my company. Um, I think if you, I think if you've got that confidence and that energy and you can articulate that, people, people buy into that. So in that, in that way, with, with someone like that, I can say absolutely no way. You know, he bought into me a lot of the time, and I see, still see it now in in the, in the public sector. No one wants to make a decision, and as they say, you don't get sacked for for you know hiring IBM or Capita. And so you only find the odd one or two mavericks within that sector who go, right, do you know what? I like what you're about. I like the innovation and I'll engage with you. That's all you need, though. That's all you need. You just need that one or two springboards and then everybody else comes with the herd effect. Yeah. OK. And were there times where you were particularly aware of that, um, I don't know, preconceptions or, you know, pre, um, uh, you know, where you felt maybe you had a little bit of an uphill struggle, you know, lacking experience because of your age, where it, it cause you to maybe I don't know enjoy the win that little bit more did it did, did mm. is it something that was consciously you were aware of yeah a little bit I t where where I felt that the most actually was when you know I my business was was acquired by a PLC um it issued a two-year profit warning within four weeks of acquiring us that's why I took over that business so I've gone from running this, this, this nice little 14 million pounds PL um up to this 100 million turnover business with 30 million quid's worth of debt and it was six and a half times over leveraged and you know even saying that i'd never heard that before i was then dragged into canary wharf to barclays bank and had a lovely meal in their restaurant there and listened to the bankers talk you know it's kind of esoteric language that i knew not, I, I didn't know what a, a, you know collars and cuffs and exotic hedges and swaps were i had no idea and i think that was the first time i felt like hold on you know, am I out of my depth here? You know, I'm too young. I've not done this before. But I also I got triggered by the fact I think they were enjoying that. I think they were enjoying this, that, you know, they could they, they probably knew I didn't know what they were talking about. I had my FD with me who was, you know, strong enough to, to control that meeting as well. But I went away and I thought to myself, Do you know what, I'm not I'm not going to let that get a better of me. So I went and I went and self self learn. I self taught. I found out about this stuff. I spoke to my FD. I went and spoke to other people in business. Had this understanding. And and I think the biggest learn from that was, people put those defences up sometimes to sound intelligent. It's not necessarily you know subject to you being young or or whatever else. But also they're full of shit most of the time. Um, and 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 they 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 they're trying to make it sound you know better you know more opaque than it really is. And. And that was that was what I got from that. But yeah, I definitely felt that there. I felt that they thought he's green, you know, he's wet behind the ears. And uh, and, I, and I found this out actually for some lawyers later on that, that they they felt the same. But we're very impressed with with actually the end result and what happened. I mean, when you're when you're at when you're at a listed company, you've got all these other you know stakeholder relationships, shareholder. You know, you mentioned going to you know big meetings in Canary Wharf. I mean, what, was it as was it the case that you were given I don't know obvious I mean, you know, the business has just released the profit warning. Were you given obvious, uh, an obvious reception with people as upfront to say that, you know, to question or to 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 um, to give a view about, you know, your capabilities to, to do the role? Yeah. Um, obviously, as you know, when you when you when you run a PLC, you're out seeing institutions. Um, and when I say, you know, I took over this business quite quickly, I was kind of dumped in there with no you know tutorial or handbook on what you need to do i'm sitting there they want to see the whites of your eyes they're asking you questions that you can't actually answer because you're in a closed period or whatever it might be um so you feel like they're they're, they're doubting you because they're pushing at you but but obviously you've got your defenses up because there's only certain things you can ask um but yeah i did feel going around the institutions were you know they i think they probably back then I, I felt it was because it was me and i was young and i was new but they probably grill everybody and because obviously they're, they're holding stock in your business i think one of the most disarming moments was when i be, when, when i was announced as ceo and at the egm and there was all the shareholders there and all, all the shareholders who turned up and i and it was question time for me and i thought oh god do you know what? I don't know the business. We had 25 offices. I don't know. I just don't know enough about all these other businesses. And any questions for the CEO? One hand goes up at the back. Uh, probably a penny shareholder. Probably put that on Motley Fool. Who knows, right? <laughs> and uh, he, he, he said, how old are you? 
And wow. do you know what? I know my age. It's quite easy for me to work out how old I was, but it was the most disarming question. I was like, oh, um, 30. And I, I I didn't know how that would go down. He just went, it's good to have some young blood and sat down. And that was it. But it made me a little bit conscious that that was the first and only question that somebody asked. And, and also, why didn't anyone else ask any questions? Was it they thought this ship's going down? He's just been chucked the car keys because he's going to crash it. And, and that's actually what happened. They chucked me the car keys because they, they thought it was going to crash anyway um, and, and kind of went about their business. But, yeah, I think when you're asked a question like that, you do look inward and say, right, okay, what am I portraying? Am I portraying not just visually and aesthetically, but in myself, am I coming out as, as a confident individual that they can trust? So, yeah, you, you do get it with institutions and you do get it with listed companies, definitely. I can only imagine what was going through in your head when you were asked that, how old you are. And actually to get the response that you did, I'm sure that wasn't what immediately came to mind. I can, I can, no. I can feel that, you know, sort of, right, uh, <laughs> uh, from, from, from that side of things. So, I mean, your observations of, since leaving there, you know, you've obviously re remained in, you know, in the industry in various guises with different mm -hmm. businesses you're, 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 you're running. I mean, I'd be keen to sort of, you know, put your brains on, you know, the, the main I suppose changes in the landscape, you know, over this, you know, over this period, and then sort of, I suppose, leading, leading a little bit towards, you know, how that's affected, you know, young professionals today. But, you know, since since that period, you know, the rate of change across many industries has been, you know, phenomenal. Mm. Of course, I mean, you know, w w what are your observations around the recruitment space over that time? I suppose recruitment over that time, it, recruitment always goes to it's always, it's always a new iteration of recruitment. Obviously, you've seen barriers to entry drop with the LinkedIn's and. And everything else and internal recruitment's become a little bit smarter than it was in the past but that's not a bad thing um i think anything that's put in put in the way of your normal practice a bit, a bit like covid i suppose there was more um e-commerce productivity and growth in q1 of 2020 than there was in the previous 10 years or something i read the other day and because you see that obstruction as just an instruction on how to get around it and the, what, what's really changed in recruitment, as in how recruiters work, is that the re recruitment technology has just advanced. I'm an investor in, you know, I, I think it's the best bit of recruitment technology in the market. And just seeing that advancement, especially over the last five years, because it's not taking away that human element to do recruitment. We, we you know, we have to deal with EQ all the time. And uh, you're dealing with one of the only commodities that can change its mind. I don't want to be sold today. I don't want to do this. And so you're dealing with emotions and, and, and tech can't do that at that level. But what it is, is it's an enabler to get you to that point quicker. So I think people have become quicker at, at, at kind of getting to this, getting through this resourcing pool. So technology has helped there. It's Preto's, Preto's law, really. You've got the 20% still being done by the human being. And for me, that's meant the market has changed from this 360 do everything recruiter to more of a 180 delivery recruiter in most businesses. You've still got those who kick down the doors and do all the work, but it's been, it's, I suppose, productized to a certain extent, but, but the whole process has been worked out. You know, everybody has got a good standard kind of operating procedure, whereas before you could just be a phenomenal salesperson and do really well. Now you, you have to be obviously good at sales and be able to connect with people but you've got to understand your domain as well. People want a little bit more insight and a little bit more knowledge from you. Um, and you need to because there are recruitment is set in, in, in its market has grown phenomenally over the last 10 years. It's just going, going you know, all, all guns all the time. And actually, even Q3, Q4 in the tech space, people are having best evers in terms of their businesses. So there's been a few markets, obviously, hospitality, my own education was tough and, and, and all those you'd expect. But we were a growing market and, and and the one thing i will say about britain and i don't i don't i'm not i'm not just saying this from a biased point of view but we are streets ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to recruitment and the brits have landed and expanded in in europe they're in america they're dominating in the, you know in the growth sector of america because they we, we've got the most uh, intensely competitive recruitment space in in britain mm. getting to london nowhere in the world even comes close and we have the most flexible worker market in the world as well we understand flexible work so you know i, th I think we're well positioned in this country especially to not necessarily worry about how how recruitment's going here but to take those skills and 
keep you know re repopulating and repeating it across the world so i'm i'm very i'm very up on recruitment I, th I think it's got a long way to go it will change it will change technology will play a bigger part but it won't take away good recruiters from that process what, what do you think the main changes are in terms if you were a young professional you know trying to make your mark maybe make that step up into you know into running a business for someone into 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 a management how, how do you think that challenge is different to when when you when you when you went through it uh on some on some parts it's easier and some parts it's harder so um it's it's harder because there's it's more fragmented there's it's more, much more of a cottage industry for smaller agencies than it used to be and a lot of them i think 70 percent of all agencies in the country are, are 10 people or less so your chances of being getting that organic growth that you used to get um you know is is, is so much harder what is easier is is actually accessing data, finding people. Everybody everybody can be found on the internet. Uh, getting people's numbers, you know, all that's in, in in the old world. You take a CV, and actually you could you'd have to create a business from a CV because I'd have to find out who you knew. I'd have to get referrals. I'd have to go in, and you're just building this organogram of your your clients and your sector. I think it was easier to start a business back then in terms of the paperwork and everything else. The, the responsibilities and liabilities now are far far greater than they were years ago but then again there's more funding available now there's, there's more access to funding than than there ever was i, I remember starting my first business with my savings and a, and a tiny dti loan that took me so much paperwork to get and you know driving back and forth to my bank manager's house and and whatever um so you know it swings it swings in roundabouts it's a bit like i was told the other week that it's harder for a first-time buyer to get on the ladder now than it was when interest rates were 15, 16, 17%. Yeah. And that's because, you know, the increase in terms of, of property value compared to the increase in actually, you know, the standard wage, it far, is, it, it far outweighs. And, and so you need so much more money now to get on a property ladder, but you'd think with interest rates this low, it must be quite easy, but it's not. So you've always got one, one's giving and one's taking away. And I, I I think it's easier in many ways to start a business now and make it a business that will cover your lifestyle. Um, but it's harder to get, you know, the the decos, the reeds, the hazes, the S3s to grow organically. I don't think you see many do that anymore. It's generally buy and build when they get to a certain stage. So they normally they normally take in some private equity money and then go on the acquisition trail. Okay. Fine. Uh, we've had some questions come through, so it seems uh, some questions I'll, uh, I'll I'll put to you. So, so one of which is, um, you know, you spoke about when you were younger, you're making decisions, and um, you know, someone's come through and asked, you know, what's the worst decision you've ever made, and and someone's followed up with, would you do it differently now? Uh, worst decision I ever made was selling my company, my first company, because you get carried away in the moment, and it's a really, and no one's going to cry, cry, cry over this, right? Because I, I did a talk at LinkedIn not long after, about the following year. I was asked to do this talk, and someone said to me, "What was it like when you went to the bank and you see all this money?" And da, 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 da. and I was like, "Okay, yeah, that's all right for about a minute, but you know, it's coming. You know, it's kind of, it's just, it's just there. Um, it doesn't really change your life because your baby was your business." And I went into that office on a Monday morning and realised I didn't own this business anymore. I was, just, I was a shareholder. In a bigger business but this wasn't my baby and it was a plc and all the things that made us great they sat me down and said you know you, you aim rules this that and you can't do the things you did before that made it fun and and that, and that destroyed my workplace so i know it's a it's, it's it's an odd thing to say but that company could have been something special and i sold it far too soon um so that that's 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 the probably the worst decision I made. What would I do differently? Um, I would I would get my, I had my passion, vision and belief. I'd get my purpose earlier. And I think if I had my purpose earlier, um, I probably wouldn't have sold my business. I probably would have been on a, on a better run rate and I would have been more self-absorbed with, with my purpose, which kind of did come to me within my, my first business. But I don't think I'd really, you know, solidified myself and, and got myself to that point. So if I could have had my purpose earlier, I think the journey would have journey would have carried on and I wouldn't have made the biggest mistake I made.
Okay. You mentioned earlier that you, you know, you, some of your current activities are involved in mentoring businesses and, and, and that side of things. Were there people that inspired and, or, you know, encouraged you in, in the early stages of your career, in the early stages of getting the, to getting the businesses up, running and sold? Yeah, there was. I, I, one thing I'll, I'll say is I've never read a self-help book. Um, I've never read anything by Richard Branson. I don't, that's never been me. I've never had a mentor. So I didn't know the value of it at the, at the time. I've always taken inspiration from people I meet because, you know, history is written by winners. You read a book, they're telling you all the good stuff and a little bit of the, you know, I, I really want to, to feel that emotion. So I think when I, when I got into recruitment, a, a chap who's now my business partner, Gary Goldsmith, um, there was a turning point in there where I was, you know, I was, I was earning 10 grand a year and I had a mortgage and whatever else. And I needed to get this commission up and running. I was a cleaner for my football club. I was, I was doing labouring on building sites and, I was disheveled and he approached me and, and said, look, you know, you're a really hard worker. Why aren't we getting these results? So they gave me a guarantee and it inspired me to do to do more things. Sonny Varkey, when I got to, you know, not, not just because of his wealth, but his backstory. So, you know, for, for four or five years, I could pick up the phone to him whenever I wanted and j just have a conversation. And if I felt that because he, because he had nothing, he had no bias in terms of giving me an answer. My parents, you know, my both my parents have worked extremely hard. My dad's 73, still works. He's an electrician, always worked for himself. And so I've seen that, you know, how how you know hard work pays off, right? And that and that's things. So I've taken inspiration from lots of people that I've met, but I suppose um Gary, Sonny, and my parents have, have been the biggest inspiration to me. And then and I think when you when you're married and have children, my my, my children and my wife inspire me every day, you know, with just just gives me a reason to do what I need to do. Okay, right, good to, uh, well, fine answer. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, and uh, someone's asked if, is there a, a, a habit, a single habit that's that's helped improve your life? Um, I have three rules that I live every day by, and I've, I have done since 1998. Um, challenge myself every day. I find something that I don't feel comfortable with, or uh, I ask a question that I, I wouldn't normally ask of someone. Um, I always make sure, and I mentioned this earlier, be better than I was yesterday. And to do that, I could have the worst day in the world, all my deals could fall out, but I would learn a word, I would learn something new. And I, and, and I saw that as an incremental improvement because you can't make sudden improvements. These are, these are all building blocks. And my biggest thing that's, that's kind of been a telling thing in my life was, at the end of the day, I wanna go home proud. And, and I could have had the worst day financially, but I need to know that I've done everything in my power before I close that door and turn off my computer that I can. And so I can go home proud that I that, that I tried and I made made sure that I, I put in the effort. And actually, I'm saying the word try. I ban try from my offices. Everybody who works with me isn't allowed to say the word try because you did or you didn't. And that way we can solve we can solve issues. So um, other than that, I'm a very, very disciplined person. I've got a lot of dedication and desire to do things I do. Uh, I think I mentioned to you when we when we spoke um, when it's when it's not locked down, I get up at four thirty in the morning. Wow. I get on a train by five. Uh, I'm in the gym by six. You know, I'm at my desk by eight o'clock, and and I and I would do that. And I, my my days and everything are very very structured. My weekends not so much, but I've got kids and sport and whatever else. But yeah, I'm, I think discipline. You know, motivation wanes. Your your passion wanes. It comes and goes, but that's where discipline gets you through. So if you can get your discipline in order and prioritize what you need to do. They just become really good habits. Okay. And if you could go back and speak to young Dean, young entrepreneurial Dean, was there is there some knowledge you 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 if you could impart to him, you would? Yeah, uh God, many, many things. But uh first of all, bankers were, were full of crap if when <laughs> when you get dragged into Canary Wharf. Um, <laughs> but but you know, work out work out your purpose, work out your why. It, Everybody says they want to make money. And I, you know, I, I hear from lots of very wealthy people who then say they've got their why. Of course, at the beginning, you know, I didn't come from any money. Uh, I come from a council state in North London. I needed, I want it to be financially secure. I want it to be financially stable. But if you can, if you can map that to your passion and your purpose, then, you know, it never feels like, it never feels like hard work. So I think if, if I was to give myself that one bit of advice, because I think it would replicate itself in many other ways, um, and represent itself in terms of my, my career further on, get your purpose earlier, you know, because sometimes it, you, you work it out after it's gone or after you could make that material difference. So yeah, definitely concentrate on your purpose. Okay, great. 
Well, look, I mean, that is, it's, it's been great to pick your brains for, for, for an amount of time today, Dean. I mean, you know, what's the best way if people want to check out some of the businesses you're involved in at the moment and, and you know, content, that that's, that's your, your thoughts on the world? What, what's the best way to sort of keep an eye on Dean Kelly? Probably the easiest way to contact me is LinkedIn. I, that D up there, I've got, I've got a course that I run with CEOs called Deanism. Uh, and I didn't make that up. It was a name coined uh, by one of my directors many years ago. For he said, you always you always come up with a deanism, so we we, we named it that. Um, so yeah, le- contact me on LinkedIn. Be- best way, um, and then I can take it off onto and, and onto other kind of lines of communication. Okay, great. Well, look, it's been it's been great to to chat to you, and look, I hope you know when we've got a uh, something else, uh, maybe an offline event at some point. You know, our paths will yeah. cross, and a big you know great to to uh uh you know get a bit more insight in front of our, our members and communities um so for this part um we so tina's going to close off the presentation sector before we go back into the to, to the to the virtual networking um so for this part dean i think we need to camera off and mic off and we'll right. disappear in the background and uh, tina i'll let you uh, close us off that's good so okay. thank you dean thank you Pete. and deanism i like that that was fantastic. I think the book in itself kind of encapsulates exactly what BitterX is about. Um, practically, um, what we'll do is we'll send we'll send a link out in the next 24 hours to everyone with information about how to register. So BitterX is the under 35s chapter of the British Hours Trading Alliance. So joining us, you still get member, you still get ability to use the British Hours Trading Alliance, all the online networking events, talks. Um, in the UK, the US, um, everywhere that the British Isles Trading Alliance works, you get to use with Bitterex as well. Um, we, we're a community of like-minded people. We see the benefit in networking with other young professionals under the age of 35. At the moment, we're completely online, although when we're back in action, we have fantastic breakfast events, we have fantastic evening drinks, and yeah, it's really worth getting involved. Um, for the Bitterex membership, it's it's only £75, which is a massive concession. Um, and you can register on the Bitter website. Now, I'll put a link for that in the chat here. And we'll also be sending you an email in the next 24 hours. But otherwise, you can go to bitter.ie and make sure you select Bitter X um, for, the, for the concession in price. It's only £75 for the whole year. So you get plenty more events like this. And fingers crossed, plenty of events in person when the time comes um the clock is ticking at the top it's rather ominous so we've got 36 minutes of networking left um laura is there a magic button that sends us all back into the room